What's up biology students? It's Mr. Holloway here with your first science video of the year. And since this is our first video of the year, uh, we're going to start with some big picture stuff about the nature of science. We're going to talk about what science is, how you do science, and why science is important. Let's start with the scientific method. And the scientific method is basically a a step-by-step -step set of kind of like instructions for how to conduct a scientific experiment. And it all starts with making observations. Making observations is a really important part of science. We look at our world, we try to look closely at it, and then we ask questions about it. Uh, based on those questions that we have about the world that we are observing, we form hypotheses. These hypotheses become sort of the framework for scientific experiments. We conduct these experiments to test our hypotheses and to gather data to tell us whether or not our hypothesis is correct. And based on that data, we either accept our hypothesis or we reject our hypothesis. And that all sounds pretty well and good. You've probably learned the scientific method before, and you're probably wondering, well, why the question mark, Mr. Holloway? Well, remember, conducting an experiment is really only one way to do science, and the scientific method is a pretty good framework for understanding what makes a good scientific experiment, but there's an awful lot of ways to do science that don't necessarily involve conducting experiments in this fashion. Science really isn't as formulaic as the scientific method makes it sound. The process of science is a lot more creative than that, and really at the heart of it is coming up with explanations for how the world works based on evidence. So keeping in mind that not all science is based on conducting experiments, we're going to start with an example today that is actually based on an experiment. And we're going to use this uh, example experiment to kind of talk about what science is and how we come to explanations based on evidence when we're doing science. So we're going to start by making some observations here about our friend the Himalayan rabbit. Uh, and one thing you might notice right off the bat is that the Himalayan rabbit has two colors of fur. Most of its fur is white, uh, but around the edges it has some patches of black fur, for example, on its ears, nose, feet, and tail. So based on these observations, we might ask ourselves a question. And we might ask ourselves what factors cause parts of a Himalayan rabbit's fur to grow black instead of white. Why isn't it all white? Or conversely, why isn't it all black? Based on that question, we're going to come up with a hypothesis, or what we think the answer to that question is going to be. It's our proposed explanation that we're going to put to the test. So, based on this question, I'm going to come up with a hypothesis that black fur grows on parts of the Himalayan rabbit's body that get the coldest. And I came up with that hypothesis because I know that when I'm out in uh, the mountains, my ears and nose and hands and feet are the parts of me that get the coldest. So, Himalayan rabbits, that sort of suggests that maybe they live in the mountains too. Maybe the parts of them that are getting the coldest are the parts that are growing black fur. And based on that hypothesis, we're going to make a prediction. And my prediction is that if new growing fur of a Himalayan rabbit is exposed to freezing cold temperatures, it will grow black instead of white. So, naturally, I'm going to get a Himalayan rabbit, and I'm going to shave a bald spot in its back, and uh, place an ice pack over this bald spot, let the fur grow back, and then check. And lo and behold, that spot of uh, fur that's growing back in from the spot I shaved in its back is growing in black. So, so far, that seems to support my hypothesis. But we need to conduct another experiment just to be sure. And in this second experiment, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to take our Himalayan rabbit, or rather a, a different Himalayan rabbit, but still a Himalayan rabbit and not like a jackrabbit or something like that. So we're going to take this second Himalayan rabbit, shave a spot in its back, only this time we're not going to put the ice pack on. And we're just going to let it grow back in without the ice pack. And as it turns out, when we do this, the Himalayan rabbit's fur grows back in white. And we had to do this second experiment because unless we did this second experiment, we wouldn't know whether it was the fact that we, we shaved a spot in the rabbit's back or the fact that we then exposed that spot to cold temperatures that made it grow back. So we needed to conduct this other experiment so that we have some basis for comparison. Our prediction so far seems to be correct. But we're going to repeat this experiment. And if we're good scientists, we're going to repeat this experiment a bunch of different times with a bunch of different pairs of rabbits. And 
if we do this experiment over and over and over again and we get the same results every time then that's really good evidence to suggest that it is in fact temperature that's causing the Himalayan rabbit's fur to grow back a different color. But the process of science doesn't stop there. Our next step is going to be to share our results with the scientific community at large. So after conducting these experiments and collecting a lot of data and determining that uh, our hypothesis was correct based on the data that we collected, we're going to write up a, a paper and submit it to a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And for it to be a peer-reviewed journal means that other scientists are reviewing our work to make sure that our conclusions are valid, that our experiments were good, that we're not introducing any bias into our experiments that might affect our results, and most importantly, that we're not going out and collecting only the evidence that supports conclusions that we already thought were true. That's a big part of what the peer review process is all about, is keeping scientists honest and making sure that they're doing the best and most scientific work that they can. If our report meets the criteria set by the journal and all of our peers are happy upon reviewing our work that we've done our due diligence to be as scientifically accurate as possible, then our work might get published in a journal like Science or Nature. And these journals are read by hundreds or thousands of scientists, probably more like hundreds of thousands of scientists around the world. And that's how we share our results with the broader scientific community, and that's how we add to the knowledge base that uh, humans have accumulated over the years, and it becomes then a, a source of information for other scientists. And based on all of that, uh, we might ask more questions about whether or not our results are going to apply to other kinds of rabbits or other kinds of mammals. Other scientists might come up with questions based on our results that might spur them to uh, conduct more experiments and conduct more investigations and gather more evidence and things like that. So really the process of science is ongoing. We accumulate knowledge, we share it with the rest of the world, we ask more questions, and then we dig deeper to try to accumulate even more knowledge. It's a process that never really ends, and we'll never really answer all the questions that there are to be answered, but hopefully we'll answer a lot of good questions along the way. So before we conclude our Himalayan rabbit example, let's use this experiment to help us define some key science vocabulary that I want you to know and be able to use in class this year. So first we have the terms observation and inference. And if you recall, we began this example by making an observation about our rabbit. And we made some observations about where on the rabbit's body it was growing white fur and where it was growing black fur. And based on those observations, we made the inference, or we made an assumption based on those observations, that maybe the difference in fur color between its body and its nose and ears and feet and tail was due to some sort of external environmental factor. So an observation is something that we can see and measure, and an inference is an assumption that we can make based on that kind of an observation. All right, next we have hypothesis and prediction. And at the beginning of our experiment, actually before we did our experiment, we came up with a hypothesis or a proposed explanation that answers the question that we initially asked. Now at some point in your life you may have learned that a hypothesis is like an educated guess. Well, I don't really think of a hypothesis that way. An educated guess is what you give on a test when you don't know the answer. And although we didn't know the answer going into this experiment either, our hypothesis was more than just a guess about what might happen. It was based on what we know about the world from other experiments. It was based on what we know about uh, animals, and I used an example from myself that my ears get cold when I go up into the mountains, so maybe that's why the Himalayan rabbit's ears are uh, growing in a different color as well. And our hypothesis helped us to make a testable prediction that then we could test and collect data to see whether or not we were right. So it's a great deal more than just an educated guess. And that prediction part is the thing that we tested in our experiment. We said if we do this, we expect that we will find this. Then we conduct an experiment to see whether or not that was the case. Next we have the terms dependent variable and independent variable. And in a scientific experiment, a variable is anything about our situation, about our system, that could change. 
And although there's a lot of things about a rabbit that could change, in this scenario, there were really only two variables that we were interested in. Our dependent variable is the thing that we don't have any control over. It's the thing that we're measuring. It's the thing that we're interested in finding out about. In this case, the dependent variable was the color of our rabbit's fur. And we predicted that the color of our rabbit's fur, whether or not it was going to be black or white, was going to depend on whether or not we put an ice pack on our rabbit's back, whether or not we exposed it to cold temperatures. And that makes cold temperature the independent variable in this case, because that was the thing that we have control over. We have control over whether or not the rabbit was exposed to cold temperatures. And based on changes that we made in that variable, we were able to determine whether those changes had any effect on the dependent variable. Because our initial assumption was that the color of the rabbit's fur depends on the temperature. So in summary, the dependent variable, that's the thing that we're measuring. That's the thing that we're interested in finding out more about. And the independent variable is the thing that we have control over. That's the thing that we are making changes to to see how those changes affect our system. And in a controlled experiment, we are going to control all of our variables, or at least as many as we can. And there are some experiments where it's really not possible to control every single variable, um, but in a lab, we should be able to control pretty much all of the variables except the one that we're interested in. So in our scenario here, you can see that in both cases, we're using the same kind of rabbit. That's a control in this variable because we didn't just pick up two random rabbits out of the wild uh, of different species and then test them to see how they would respond because if they're different species, they may respond to changes in their environment differently. We also controlled our variables in that uh, this spot that we shaved in the back of each rabbit was the same spot in each rabbit. Each rabbit started with white fur in that case. It appears as though each rabbit is an adult rabbit, so we don't have a baby rabbit and an adult rabbit. And if we're really controlling all of our variables, we also want to do things like make sure we feed both rabbits the same kind of food. We want to make sure that we are uh, keeping each rabbit in the same kind of environment. We want to make sure that basically everything about these two rabbits is exactly the same except for this thing that we're interested in finding out more about. That independent variable should be the only thing that's different about these two situations. And then anything else that turns out to be different at the end, namely the fact that one rabbit grew black fur and the other rabbit grew white fur, means that it must be due to that thing that we changed. And that's how we know that temperature causes this change in fur color in the Himalayan rabbit because that was the only thing that was different and that's what makes it a controlled experiment. But our next terms are qualitative data and quantitative data. And you can remember the difference between these two words kind of based on the beginning of each one. Qualitative data kind of starts with the word quality. Quantitative data sort of starts with the word quantity. Qualitative data is data about the qualities of the thing that you are looking at. So, in this case, we collected qualitative data about our uh, rabbit by looking at it. And we could see that this rabbit that had the ice pack on its back grew in a black spot of fur, and this rabbit that had no ice pack on its back grew in a white spot of fur. Now we can't really describe either of those things in numbers, but we're describing the qualities or the appearance of our rabbit following these experiments. Quantitative data is data that can be measured in numbers. So when we conducted this experiment over and over and over again on uh, 10 different pairs of rabbits, we were able to collect quantitative data. And at the end of this experiment, we could say something like 75% of the rabbits who were exposed to ice packs grew in dark fur on their back, or 85%, or 90%, or in this case, 100% of our rabbits who were exposed to ice packs grew in a black patch of fur on their back. So that's quantitative data because we can quantify it in numbers, whereas qualitative data 
We can't really describe it in numbers, but we can describe its appearance, its color, its texture, its shape, uh, its odor, its taste, things like that. Not that we'd want to smell or taste our rabbit necessarily, but those are just examples of different kinds of qualitative data that you might collect. And a good scientific conclusion is always based on evidence. It's not based on what we think or what we feel or uh, what we hoped was going to happen. It's based on what we were able to measure, what we actually saw happen. And scientific conclusions sometimes tell a scientist that they were wrong about what they originally thought. And that's fine as long as we're coming to conclusions based on evidence. And I have sort of a formula for you that's going to help us write good scientific conclusions this year. And that formula I call Claim, Evidence, and Reasoning. And all good scientific conclusions should include a claim, they should include supporting evidence, and they should include reasoning that explains why that evidence supports the claim. So here's an example. From this experiment, based on the data that we collected, our claim is that the fur color of a Himalayan rabbit depends on temperature and grows black in response to low external temperatures. The evidence that supports that claim goes like this. In experiments, Himalayan rabbits exposed to ice packs regrew black fur on bald spots, whereas rabbits without, without ice packs regrew white fur. So that evidence supports the claim that we just made. And in our reasoning section, we should explain why. So in our reasoning, we're going to say fur color must depend on temperature because temperature was the only difference between the two experiments. And only rabbits exposed to cold temperatures regrew black fur instead of white fur. So we gave a claim. We supported our claim with some evidence, and then we gave some reasoning to help explain why that evidence supports our claim. Now, if it's a really, really good conclusion, we might also explain why the evidence doesn't support a different claim. So, for example, we might say that uh, fur color doesn't depend on diet, because in this case, both rabbits were fed an identical diet, and only one of them uh, grew black fur instead of white fur. Now that would be a really expert level scientific conclusion. And that's really what makes something science. It's not that we're conducting experiments that make something science or make something not science. It's that we're coming to conclusions based on evidence. And I like to think of science as a way of knowing because it helps us to know more about the world. For example, we know something about Himalayan rabbits now based on evidence that we were able to collect and based on that evidence, we were able to do some reasoning and come to a conclusion about why Himalayan rabbits look the way they do. So we know more about the world now based on this process, based on science. And in this case, it was based pretty much on what we might call the scientific method. But remember, I'll say it a lot, that's not the only way to do science. If we do another quick example using this graph that you see on the left side of your screen, you should notice that this graph is titled Pollinator Diversity in Ecosystems at Various Distances from Urban Areas. Based on this, we might infer that whoever put together this graph had a question about where they were likely to find more pollinators, close to cities or farther away. And if you've been keeping up with the news, you might also infer that this is based on the fact that pollinator populations around the world are currently not doing so well. Pollinator populations are declining very, very rapidly, some faster than others. And this is a big concern for us because pollination helps provide us with food and helps plants to reproduce in the ecosystem. So if pollinator populations are dying off, we probably have a lot of questions about why that is. And we might want to... Uh, use our answers to these questions to try to fix this problem and improve our quality of life. So, we might go out and collect some data. And based on this data, we might be able to identify some patterns and relationships. And in this graph here, hopefully you can see that as the distance from urban areas increases, the number of pollinator species also increases. Basically, that means that the farther we are away from cities, the more species of pollinators we're likely to find. And based on this pattern and this relationship, we could conclude that cities have a negative effect on pollinator populations.
Based on that conclusion and based on the trends that we see in this graph, we might be able to predict that as more and more urban areas continue to spring up and as urban areas expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, there are going to be fewer and fewer places that are sufficiently far enough away from urban areas to support diverse pollinator populations. And that means that we're likely to find a lot more places like this. As we have more cities, we're going to have fewer and fewer pollinators based on the trends that we see in this graph. We might identify that as a big problem because, like I said, pollinators help provide us with food and they help plants in the environment to reproduce. So this is a problem that's probably worth trying to solve. This is going to lead to more questions about how we can help support pollinator populations while also meeting the needs of the human populations, and hopefully we'll be able to come up with some answers to those kinds of questions. Hopefully we'll be able to help the pollinators, and hopefully we'll be able to improve the quality of life not only for people, but for other organisms on our planet as a result. Because science has the ability to help us identify and ultimately solve problems, science has done a great deal to make our world a better place. Science is helping us to lead a better existence all the time. And when we talk about science as a way of knowing, it's important for us to acknowledge that science isn't the only way of knowing about the world, but it's a pretty good way of knowing about the world, and it's a way that ultimately is helping us to lead better lives, helping us to make more informed decisions, and helping us to uh, continue to live on this planet for as long as we possibly can.